Uh, now we can invite the administration to come in. I'd like to welcome the administration team. I will not introduce you one by one. Follow up meet, uh, to the last meeting. On the 12th of May, um, the administration has now responded to concerns and issues raised at that meeting. That's in paper, CB bracket 2, 15, 61, stroke 14 to 15, bracket 01. Can I now ask Mr. Davy Chong from the Bureau to introduce the paper, and members will have the floor afterwards. Thank you, Chairman. This paper is to respond to questions and comments raised at the Bills Committee um, on the 12th of May. It's not a long paper. Um, there are three and a half pages to it. There was a proposal to say that we include and other requirement in the um, amendments, and that is to require proof of financial gain in the offence. And we also gave members extra information about uh, clauses of exemption or defence for employees. We have cited a case law with regard to the word causing and how it was interpreted by the court. The rest have to do with statistics members asked for. In the last part of the paper, um, we respond to the point made by members about review of the ordinance. At the last meeting, when we responded orally, we already said that we would be quite happy to actively look into this issue together with the CHRT and based on uh, special circumstances, as we explained last time, we might not be able to give you a concrete timetable at this stage. But we promise to keep the electrical panel and health services informed of progress. We said that last time, and we have now put that in writing. I think I'll stop there, Chairman. OK. Like our legal advisor, to comment on the response by the administration. Legal advisor, please. Thank you, Chairman. I'd like to refer to paragraphs 4 to 6 of the paper, meaning clauses of exemption or defense for employees. You quote the prosecution code and also the Privy Council case. Is it your intention, or is it that the legislative intent is that you are not targeting employees? When you make reference to the prosecution code and the Privy Council case, uh, what is the point that you are trying to illustrate? Chairman, we'd like to explain the elements of the offence. Um, we did not write extensively on it, but the elements of the offence must be subject to very high standards of interpretation. Like in the Privy Council case, the word cause or causing must 
be the subject of contemplation or desire before the offence is committed. So we can see that it may not be very easy for employees to break the law. I'd also like to follow up on the point made by the legal advisor. In our previous discussion, members said they were quite worried that after the amendment bill comes into practice, um, the clause is not that um, clear. You uh, say that um, these people may appear to be employees of the people behind the advertisements. Um, you are talking about the advertising company, the media which carry the advertisement and also even staff working at websites. They are all given responsibility. But in fact, the principal or the boss may not be directly involved. In that case, if there is no defense, then it will be quite unfair to employees. As for the Privy Council case, um, the case number AC876. Now, can you help to allay our worries? Say if uh, an employee should not be included in the list of people who will be prosecuted or convicted in normal circumstances, or else we will be worried that without the defense clause, um, the real culprits can go scot-free, but not the employees uh, who will uh, then be convicted. Thank you, Chairman. Mem uh, Mr. Chairman, you are worried about uh, whether employees will be caught under the element causing to be published or distributed. The Privy Council case is such that with regard to causing to be published or distributed, the court has to see whether he has contemplated or desired that the act would ensue. And also, this person must have control or influence over the other person. Therefore, Employees normally do not have control or influence over the other person. Usually, it is a, an employer who will have such influence or control. Therefore, uh, from the interpretation of these ingredients of offense, it will not be easy for employees to be caught unless um, they are proactive in engaging in such irregular acts, or else they will not be uh, caught under this interpretation of causing. Um, Mr. Luke, apart from this case AC876, have we had cases of a similar nature? In other words, the employees are said to be convicted of uh, causing to be published or distributed. And what about cases where there is a conviction but uh, there was a successful appeal? Um, actually, in para 8, we say we have done a search on employees and advertisements and whether there has been conviction or the conditions of conviction. Unfortunately, we are unable to find a relevant reported criminal case on advertisement. In other words, those 200 cases are about advertisements or offence, but none of those is 
similar to this um, element, and uh, there has been no conviction. Yes, you can put it that way. We already searched widely, and we keyed in the generic terms of advertisement and of fans, and we have been able to find 200 case results. And after looking at those cases, we cannot find a similar one to the present bill. Members, in the government's reply, uh, paragraphs 9 and 10, you can see um, there is mention of the undesirable medical advertisements ordinance, um, CAP 231. From 2012 to 2015, the D of H tells us that there have been 31 advertisements, but none of them involved employees. Is that right? With regard to the 31 convictions, is it that all those are responsible persons or they are the direct beneficiaries or those who have taken out the advertisement. Is that right? None of the convictions have to do with an employee. Is that right? Dr. Choi, you are correct, Chairman. We can look at the UMAO, um, which governs medical advertisements. As the Chairman pointed out, out of the 31 advertisements and the people convicted, None has to do with an employee. Those are treatment providers or product distributors or retailers. Why is that so? This echoes para 4 of the paper. When the DOJ considers taking out prosecution, Apart from the sufficiency of evidence, the DOJ also looks at whether this is in line with the general public interest. That is the principle we act under. And in the last three years, prosecutions taken out under UMAO have also abided by this principle. Well, this is true at least where um, laws relating to hygiene and health are concerned. Uh, but I'd like to refer to Paris 2 and 3 about financial gain in the paper. I'd like to seek some clarification. You did not say whether the 31 cases involved direct or indirect financial gain. But if I may, I can see that financial gain was one of the conditions. Is that right? Therefore, if we ask for the proof of financial gain in the offense, that can be established. Uh, can we say that you have considered it, if, even if you did not put it down here? I cannot give you an answer here because I know that the DOJ has given consideration to the public interest as to whether there is financial gain, whether that is uh, an element in the prosecution code, I cannot answer on behalf of the DOJ. In the past, I've seen that under the uh, in a work for the uh, UMAO, whether it's for the investigation or during our negotiations, with DFJ, our biggest purpose was not to sue people. What we wanted most was to make these advertisements, I know, disappear from Hong Kong. Of course, during the procedures of law enforcement or investigation, we will. You know, if we were to prosecute, we would actually identify who should we prosecute to get the maximum deterrent effect. So you can see from the data that the data show to us that 
you know, uh, these people identified have interests involved, and that's why they have the incentives to break the law. So the DFJ, uh, you know, will consider whether you know the case is established, and whether you know what we found constitutes an element of a criminal offence. Thank you, members. Any questions? If not, I think let's go to excuse me. Paragraph six. Paragraph six. Prosecutions for online advertisement advertisements. I think in the uh, reply from the DOJ, there are 650 related um, causes involving 2020 pieces of legislation, but we're not given any prosecution figures. What's the reason? Is it because you never lodged any prosecutions, or you know, or In relation to the, you know, that you couldn't actually uh, find any link with the reproductive technology ordinance, with you know, because uh, of the 650 clauses, 220 of them were legislations or subsidiary legislations, but none were related to human reproductive technology. Is it because nobody broke the law? So there's no reference you could make at all. Well, thank you, Chairman. We searched the keywords, and we found more than 650 courses with the um, generic terms. Most of them uh, were not actually um, related to criminal offenses. Let me give you some background here. It may be a bit vague. The internet is only, you know, a medium for human interactions. You can um, get in touch with other people through fax or telephone. So there are all sorts of communication channels for a case. You know, case is just part of what happened in total. There may be um, really cases that are not related to um, any piece of legislation that could be found on the internet. So it's very difficult by nature. It's difficult to for us to provide you with the prosecution figures. So, Mr. Look, you're saying that. You could not find any relevant prosecution figures. Okay, so the 650 entry entries are, are unrelated to prosecution. Um, yeah, because in our previous meeting we care very much. You know, you raised a lot of concern about whether the internet would become a trap. You know, under the uh, even under the new amendment ordinance. It seems that from your paper and you know, from your reply, it seems that that may not be the case. But I don't know whether members are also concerned or have the same concern, because um, there is now the um, con controversies about last time. For example, uh, we said that uh, we mentioned about the wording, some of the wordings. Used and the uh, administration had given us some paper that set to our query, and then there are the two remaining concerns about you know um, the terms financial gain and causes of exemption. Those are two areas of concern we want to follow up on. Besides that, I think there are no other um, areas that we want to follow up on. Any other questions, members? If not, then 
Shall we have clause by clause scrutiny? Because it's not complicated if the amendment bill is not complicated. If there are no other policy considerations, then we can ask the administration to take us through um, the clauses. Any questions, queries? No? Okay. If not, then Mr. Chung. Thank you, Chairman. As Chairman said, this amendment bill is relatively simple. The uh, main um, proposal you know, content was discussed in the previous meetings, but um, for Clause 1, uh, well, it mentions the short title and the commencement date. We plan to, once the amendment bill is passed, we would uh, reserve one to several months' time. to inform relative bodies about the um, new offenses. We will be very careful because of you know, the committee's concern to collect more information and try to contact you know uh, local uh, you know companies with businesses on the internet so they are aware of this new provision. Well in uh, clause three uh, we have added 3A and 3B, sessions 3A and 3B. They're pretty short. We actually have lengthy discussions on these two additional clauses uh, or uh, newly added provisions. In uh, clause 4, we've added 39 under 39, 3A um, to stipulate the penalties for the designated offense. Okay, legal advisor, any views? Advisor. Thank you, Chairman. On um, Clause 3A, I've got um, three worries. First, well, ultimately, you know, it, 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 for advertisements on the internet, last time in your summary response, tw paragraph 20 and 21, you mentioned that, particularly paragraph 21, you say that for someone who's not from Hong Kong, who Distributed advertisement on the internet outside of Hong Kong, you would uh, hold them legally liable. But in your clause here, it says um, they should not, anyone should not cause to be published or distributed or knowingly publish or distribute an advertisement whether or not the services are provided in Hong Kong. So I can't see why from this clause you can um, actually govern the behavior of people outside of Hong Kong. How can you have the legal effects on people outside of Hong Kong? Mr. Look, thank you, Chairman. I think uh, in the in our summary response, paragraph 21, it meant to say that uh, for anyone who uh, operate in Hong Kong, they would fall under the jurisdiction here. So technically speaking, technically speaking, these people would could be held liable. So, so I don't quite see what you meant. So you're saying, say, a foreign website, if it's to be proven, so it has to be proven that it is uh, in operation in Hong Kong. Say if it's a U.S. website, and if it doesn't have any uh, physical um, entity in Hong Kong, so it's totally based overseas, then based on your legislative intent in future, um, that website operator would not be bound by this law, right? Say if, I, if I'm if i running a website in Thailand and and only, for example, someone in Hong Kong look at these advertisements on human reproductive technology, but because that website does not have a registra registered business address in Hong Kong, then based your your own uh, explanation that we cannot sue that website owner, right? If anything happens. Yeah, back to the um, offense itself. It says that uh, a person must not cause to be published or distributed. So even if a website or a server is not based in Hong Kong, as long as technically, if if it fills the criteria that it is publishing or caused to be published or distributed in Hong Kong, then it could breach the law. It could be held liable. But it's difficult to say whether um, how common it is for such people to be prosecuted because 
you know, um, there are all sorts of ways for information to be stored on the internet. Some people may be put people may put information in cloud or um, distribute information on different servers. So it really depends on whether the um, website owner concerned meets the condition of uh, actually distributing or causing to be um, published in Hong Kong. Mr. Chung, yes, I think in our response last time we already spelled out our view. As we explained last time, Hong Kong's jurisdiction is uh, territorial. So there would be restraints on um, our law enforcement. Collecting evidence outside the territory is not easy, and there could be difficulties. So remember, there was a suggestion of um, creating exemption of overseas websites and servers. We do consider that. In terms of, of course, law enforcement and um, you know prosecution, there were cons there are constraints, but we don't want to write in the beginning. You know, let me put it this way. We don't want to uh, bind our hands too much. At this stage, of course, I wouldn't say I'm very confident that I could do this or do that. But in considering, you know, who we would target in our work, normally we'll be um, focusing on people who are actually affecting Hong Kong people, targeting Hong Kong people, advertisements targeting Hong Kong people. So that's what we want to focus on. But if we, you know, um, actually put down too much details in the course, then that could actually bind our uh, hands. So, so if there are uh, advertising materials uploaded on the internet that target Hong Kong people, for example, citing or quoting Hong Kong dollars using complex Chinese characters, or even with the content. Person, you know, uh, with email and telephone number for Hong Kong uh, contact. Then I think in that circumstance, you know, uh, you know, we, we'll we'll see if we can take any action. We may not effectively enforce the law in the case or in the case of overseas servers, but we do. One. That our law enforcement authorities, for example, on uh, you know information provided on the basis of information information provided locally, we do hope the law enforcement authorities can take some sort of action. So I do. I know it's difficult, but at least I don't want to you know uh, impose uh, limits now here by putting. Um, too much details there. For example, I can I've read in the paper some advertisements about human reproductive technology, technology you no know, sex selection service in Thailand. You may have seen it in newspapers. And the agency concern is based in Thailand. The website it also um, lists the website address. There's no contact in Hong Kong mentioned in that ad. It says that if you want any help, just go to the website or call a Thai number. So there's no link at all to Hong Kong. So in that case, based on this, um, you know, uh, clause and also your concept of the Hong Kong jurisdiction, we can't lodge any prosecution. But indeed, these people are advertising in Hong Kong, and there's no person in charge in Hong Kong. So, what can we do? You can't prosecute them. Should we just prosecute the publishers? Or the reporters, the editorial board of the newspaper, we will be worried because you will not be targeting the one who takes out the advertisement but the media. Whether we are talking about newspapers, magazines or radio stations, is that going to be the case? Let me try to say something. You mentioned a local newspaper advertising about HRT in Thailand. 
Chairman, you are correct. In that case, we may not be able to prosecute the Thailand company because it depends on the evidence. But if our objective is to ban such advertisements so they will not appear in Hong Kong, we hope our law will have a certain deterrent effect. That is our legislative intent, and we'd like to catch certain companies, including the one taking out the advertisement, two, the one publishing the advertisement, uh, newspapers, magazines, and three, the agents which um, act as intermediaries and help to place advertisements in Hong Kong. These companies are all our targets. Well, if I have heard you correctly, whether it be the agent, the advertiser, or the one taking out the advertisement, if they are related to Hong Kong, you will try to get the person in charge, not the employee. Is that right? Even if this is not in the bill, listening to you and uh, also from the case law you have quoted, because we are afraid that you are going to target the print room officers or staff. Well, if you go for the biggest shareholder of the newspaper company, uh, if it is a listed company, or you go to the head of the editorial staff, um, I am not sure whether you should catch these people. Of course, we'd like you to provide some exemptions, but you have been unwilling. I think it's difficult to continue that argument with you unless members will themselves move a CSA, uh, or else I don't think we are going to have it. But at this stage, I'd like to ask for your legislative intent, whether you have no intention to target the manager of the media organizations. Is that right? Mr. Chung, Chairman, if uh, there is an agency who is responsible for placing the advertisement, we will go for the pe person in charge. As we said, even if we use the word person in the law, it actually includes the concept of the person in charge, not just that person who places the advertisement. It is not as narrow as that. Please be reassured. Legal advisor, uh, do you need to seek some clarification? Thank you, Chairman. I still don't understand why in a clause uh, like this you can regulate people who are not from Hong Kong. If you look at the act of causing to be published or distributed, the act has to take place in Hong Kong. If uh, over the internet a U.S. person can publish an advertisement and you say you can still control it, well, I can't see how you can do it because in the clause you don't say whether or not the advertisements are distributed in Hong Kong. Can the administration please explain more? Mr. Luke, the word distribution, uh, I remember we might have already commented on it in a written manner. As for the elements of the offense, even if you are not in Hong Kong and then you place certain information on the Internet, if as a matter of fact it can be viewed in Hong Kong, then technically speaking, it will amount to distributing within Hong Kong. I hope uh, I have clarified the point. Legal advisor, does it work? Thank you, Chairman. I think it is a letter dated the 8th of April. In that letter, you say that usually if an advertisement can be seen in Hong Kong, it would amount to distribution. I'd like to ask you whether you have case law to support yourself because distribution and viewing are two different acts. Do you have a case law to support you, meaning that uh, viewing in Hong Kong amounts to distributing in Hong Kong? Well, that is how the word distribution is normally understood. 
uh, you mean you don't have a case law, but uh, it is how it is normally understood. Yes, it's just like libel cases. If the libel can be seen overseas, um, the act of libel can be said to have taken place in the U.S. You mean a U.S. internet provider can be convicted. But the legal advisor has been asking you how you can achieve conviction because that person or agent is not in Hong Kong. Now I can give you an example if it is Uh, if web hosting is done in the U.S. and it, but it uses the traditional Chinese character and local Hong Kong Chinese uh, to write the advertisement and maybe they even interview a Hong Kong Chinese female to say it is very good service. Now, of course, um, there is nothing else that connects it in to Hong Kong. You mean you can still? subject that person to prosecution and conviction. I'm following on the viewpoint of the legal advisor. Uh, as I said, the jurisdiction of Hong Kong is territorial, meaning even if technically an act takes place in Hong Kong and there is an element of offense, but if Even if the person doing the act is not in Hong Kong, the jurisdiction of Hong Kong can still cover him. This is the basic position. Well, you can have mutual legal assistance with other countries, but that is indirect and time consuming. As the administration said, uh, we understand there are difficulties. In other words, the legal advisor's point of view is correct. You cannot convict him. Ah, yes. Okay, then. Finally, it is not a matter for us to agree or not agree because we have considerations for territoriality. But the position of the government is that we don't want to tie our own hands in the clauses. If you ask me and impress me for an answer, I would say it is very difficult. However, we don't want to tie our own hands in the law. I remember it was uh, Dr. Leung who said that person has to take a flight and transit in Hong Kong and for you to arrest him in our airport. Or else if he doesn't travel to Hong Kong or transit in Hong Kong, then you just cannot catch him. Uh, that is consistent with the observation of the legal advisor, right? Okay, legal advisor. Any other points? Thank you, Chairman. If you say viewing in Hong Kong amounts to distribution in Hong Kong, I can't say that um, it is very proper. If you talk about tort under libel, you quoted uh, a Canadian case. Actually, that case explains what amounts to publishing. I think we need to clarify something about that case. It is um, libel or tort in writing. And in that case, you need to prove that one or more than one third party has received it before uh, publication is established. If you want to apply this concept of publication under libel here, you need to be cautious. Is this really how you want to interpret the word publication under 15.3a? And in that Canadian case, uh, it only seeks to interpret the word publication. But here, you also have the word distribution. And I can't see any case law saying that viewing in Hong Kong equals to distribution in Hong Kong. If a U.S. doctor advertises in a U.S. magazine and you distribute 
um, I mean, this act of distribution, do you think it takes place in the U.S. or in Hong Kong? Mr. Luke, Chairman, uh, I have been talking about the word distribution. I mentioned the libel law just for the sake of illustration. Um, point is taken, and I agree with the legal advisor that in civil tort law, um, the word publication may be understood in a different way from the criminal code. That is why I did not talk about the word publication, but only distribution. From what we understand, distribution does not have any special interpretation. It depends on the facts. If, as a matter of fact, the message or the advertisement is distributed in Hong Kong, then it is distributed in Hong Kong. It's very straightforward. But I can ask you this question to follow up on the LA's point. A Hong Kong doctor or an organization, let's not talk about doctors, an organization in Hong Kong advertises in a foreign magazine um, and uh, it's a long article on HRT. But then um, the advertisement might be in a Thailand magazine or US magazine. However, the publication, that is, the magazine is distributed in a seminar in Hong Kong. In the end, Someone may therefore respond to the advertisement and goes to Thailand or the U.S. to patronize the HRT institution. So can you prosecute this person, yes or no, and what, for what reason? Thank you, Chairman. You uh, asked a hypothetical question, a doctor, right? No, an organization, an organization. It advertises in the magazine and then he distributes the magazine after a talk or seminar. The magazine is not published in Hong Kong. The interview and everything that is um, advertised, uh, maybe the services or experience, all that happens in overseas countries. But first of all, then, we have to see whether it complies with the definition of advertisement in the bill. No. Uh, it is not an advertisement, it's a magazine and it's distributed. In the magazine, uh, there is this article. Maybe out of a hundred articles, one article is on this. Let me try to explain. Chairman, you said an organization publishes advertisements on HRT in a magazine overseas, and then the magazine is distributed in a seminar in Hong Kong. Do I understand you correctly? Yes. Now, maybe Mr. Luke can supplement the legal aspect, but we can go back to what we said before, and that we need to have the elements of the offense. Now, of course, we are talking about an overseas magazine and uh, there is an advertisement in it on sex selection. Now until this point there is no offense in Hong Kong. However, it carries the advertisement and the person knows that in Hong Kong such advertisements cannot be distributed. However, he promotes this in a seminar in Hong Kong. And then that would amount to an offense or an act where somebody knowingly promotes sex selection knowing that it is illegal. But whether that can be an offense, it depends on the evidence, the nature of the seminar, and whether how the uh, advertisement is presented. In other words, you can, right? Listening to you, you mean yes. Yeah, it seems they can because, you know, there are the seminar and distribute magazines introducing the service, even though it's only one article among a hundred articles. Yeah, let me supplement of the hundred articles, yeah. But this um, new offense requires some sort of uh, you know um spiritual element. 
It really depends on whether. Say I give you hundred pages, ninety nine pages are blank. Insert among them are the information for criminal offenses in Hong Kong. You the you know um, the burden of proof, you know, uh, is very demanding. So if in the case of the magazine, on the whole, or on the surface, it doesn't look any different, but inside it is a very small advertisement, and you would try to see whether it really has the intention of distributing the advertisement. So of course, if it's uh, uh, the whole magazine that's composed of. A lot of advertisements on the area, and of course, it's very obvious that it, it has the intent to um, commit a crime. But if it's only one single advertisement in a magazine of hundred pages, then then we have to deal with it differently. I can imagine, you know, the difficulties with um, prosecution if there is no obvious. Well, leaflets are easy to see, advertisements easy to see, but if they give you one whole magazine uh, in which only a very, very small portion is about the service, then maybe we can we can't launch any prosecution. So I think we have to take note of this. Once this amendment bill comes into effect, then we may you know run into um, those cases. Yes. Okay, next one. Um, Lang Kalo. Well, I thought this issue has been dealt with. Well, I'll talk about distributing. Can you be specific about, uh, you know, only those distributed in Hong Kong? Can be uh, could be branded illegal, because it just then you said it'll be distributed in outside of Hong Kong, and if the person does not come into Hong Kong, then there's no way you can enforce the law, because Hong it lies outside of Hong Kong's jurisdiction. But sometimes it's a matter of principle. You know, Hong Kong laws govern what happened in Hong Kong. So, if uh, the materials are distributed in Hong Kong, then it's against the law. But on the internet, there are materials that are not distributed in Hong Kong. Well, it also has to do with the collection of bird of proof. Hong Kong laws govern Hong Kong. Affairs. I was just so uh, watching this on my mobile phone. You, you, you're saying that the distribution has to be um, limited to distribution distribution Hong Kong. Is that right? Yes. As for Leung, Mr. Lang's query, if I understand it correctly, you're saying that, say. If uh, if it if it specifies that the material concern will be distributed in Hong Kong, then um, indeed, well, you don't need to specify that it's to be um, targeted, um, you know, targeting Hong Kong people, unless you also state that it includes places outside of Hong Kong, without stating where it's. To be distributed, then according to the um, usual interpretations, you know, then we would take it as uh, meaning that the distribution is for Hong Kong. Well, I think your understanding can answer my question without specifying. You're saying it without specifying. When the case comes to court, the court will interpret it as meaning that the behavior, be behavior has to have happened in Hong Kong before it can. Um, Rule on it, but do you have any uh, basis for your claim? Please put it on record if you have any basis for your claim. So in the future, whenever there are disputes, people can refer back to what you just said because that's this can resolve the question raised by the legal advisor. That is, we are worried about someone you know whose uh, behavior against the law happened outside of Hong Kong. Because in that place, for example, for example, in the states, distributing such materials are legal. So advertising on his local website are legal. But once when he comes to Hong Kong, and if he doesn't feel that there's nothing anything wrong with what he had done, 
in his home country, he can use that as a as a defense, because of saying you know, by saying that the law concerned implies that the um, act has to have happened in Hong Kong. But you know the fact is the materials were distributed to the states. Could we put this in on record? Okay, you're fine with that. Well, I do hope that uh, Mr. Look can give us a written reply. That's better. And so, we're uh, having verbal exchanges here. Um, I've asked Mr. Chung about the um, difficulty with um, law enforcement. So, I do hope that you can give us your replies in writing. That will help us to, you know, understand more clearly your legislative intent. Legal advisor? Well, in our previous written submission to you, our last written submission to you our, in our response to your questions, we actually made similar points. You can make reference to paragraph 19 indeed. Let me read out to you our reply is that Hong Kong the primary basis of Hong Kong jurisdiction is territorial. Unless it's specified by the law otherwise, the court would not pay attention to behavior um, conducted outside of Hong Kong. And uh, when ruling, the court will assume that all the illegal behaviors, all the uh, behaviors or offenses that happened over outside of Hong Kong would not be dealt with in the court here. Okay. In the last. Yeah, administration's reply on overseas internet and servers. Yeah, they gave us this reply. Is it okay, legal advisor? Yeah, paragraph nineteen. That's the big principle. But the question is uh, lies with paragraph twenty-one. Where is that if it's uh, a foreigner who distributes the advertisement advertisements through the internet, he would be held liable. But I feel that if you haven't specified that wherever the advertisements are distributed in Hong Kong or outside of Hong Kong, then this is not consistent with what's in paragraph 21. I think the way that it's written now cannot achieve the legal result or effect of uh, what's mentioned in paragraph 21. Here you say that, you know, um, if it happens in Hong Kong, um, behavior that happens in Hong Kong will be um, under the jurisdiction of Hong Kong. But this is bit, bit does not tie in with um, what's written in paragraph 21 that you just mentioned. That is um, concerning what sort of behaviors would be um, could be held liable. So what legal basis do you have to um, rule that um, behaviors conducted overseas could be held liable here? I think ultimately we are talking about the legal effect. I mean, there are sort of uh, inconsistencies there. If you say that only behavior that happens in Hong, Kong, but the, the bigger principle, the overall principle is correct that only behaviors that happen in Hong Kong will be um, dealt with by local courts. Okay, if there's confusion, and you think that your legislative intent governs what happens here, then why don't you make it? Plain. Just write it clearly that it only governs um, what happens in Hong Kong. Then that would do away with the confusion. Instead of you know, just um, quoting, you know, trying to um, address it by quoting normal practices. Yes. Since that's your legislative intent, why don't you just uh, write it out clearly? Yeah, equal advisors have always been asking the same question. Your verbal resp I think the administration agreed verbally. If it's a overseas um, internet or website with the jurisdiction of Hong Kong now, there's nothing uh, Hong Kong can do. You know, uh, even if that website breaks the law. So why should we insist that? Uh, uh, law cover, you know, overseas. 
websites. Well, Jim, I think there's a difference. If the websites are overseas, but if it's if the person issuing the advertisements on that website are based in Hong Kong, then the government should take action because I don't even know, you know, where. You know, some websites are based. You can tell from the address that you know some websites from the address of of these sites that they are based overseas. But if you post information on overseas internet uh, website, that that people may tr be trying to uh, take advantage of a loophole. But if it's not distributed in Hong Kong, so it, but distributed in the states, then we it's not logical for us to. Um, Govern such advertisements. Now, the intent, our intent, is to um, govern advertisements distributed here. Then let's make it clear. Um, just then, uh, legal advisor talks talks about nineteen paragraph two nineteen to twenty. Uh, they cover two different areas. Paragraph nineteen talks about the jurisdictions, the territorial jurisdictions for sex selection service. Provider um, who provides or distributes advertisements in their own country, then that's not what the existing amendment bill wants to um, govern. But why we are worried that we should ask for provision of adequate evidence to show that there is com a criminal element. Because we have seen cases where there are intermediaries or Hong Kong companies which Post advertisements uh, on overseas internet websites. So if we um, make it clear that the law would not govern overseas websites, then then we will be, as Mr. Chung said, tie up our hands. And Mr. Leung just then mentioned that there are some Hong Kong people distribute advertisements on overseas websites, and that's exactly what we are worried about. And we want, to, and that's also what we want to regulate. That's why there's this paragraph 19 and paragraph 21 that leaves the room for us to provide the room for us to regulate these advertisements posted on overseas websites. Mr. Leung? In that case, we don't make it clear then. Or in clause three A, or just make it clear that you know um, where the website is supposed to be. So it's another matter whether you can collect the evidence to show that it's uh, they're based in Hong Kong. But we also worry that there may be scenarios where you know there are overseas uh, websites um, with the Hong Kong advertisements, and then they use other means to attract Hong Kong people to access those websites. I've noticed that in clause 3A, it says uh, whether or not the services are provided in Hong Kong. So that means, well, this refers to the um, human reproductive technology services. And Mr. Lau is, is referring to the medium, the platform, whether it's the internet or actual advertisement. They have to be distributed in Hong Kong before they are governed by this law. That's reasonable. Mr. Chung? Well, last time, paragraph 19 and paragraph 20 in the last paper um, present to you our um, analysis. The, the, there's this constraint posed by the jurisdiction. Um, I don't know whether you would look at it as the uh, normal approach. We do understand it's difficult because there's this territorial um, boundaries and collecting evidence is not easy. But having considered members' views, and we do not support the suggestion. This is because we know there are similar situations now. The services may be provided overseas, and they may be uploaded to overseas servers or overseas websites. But if this is indeed done, there is very little we can do. And if it is an international company, and uh, the targets of its 
information will be all over the world. This is exactly what members are worried about. But if certain persons or organizations operate business in Hong Kong, should we not tackle those? This is the first step, uh, that is distribution of advertisements. If we already examine these people, um, we have talked to the DOJ, then um, we may not be able to establish the prima facie case. And in that case, there is nothing we can do because you will exempt these people even as a first step. We understand uh, there may not be many of these cases, but if possible, we like to preserve these situations within the scope of the offense. And that is, uh, as a first step, distribution on the Internet. We don't want to weaken our enforcement powers. As for Para 21, this is about a hypothetical case. If the person does not live in Hong Kong, um, this is the territoriality issue and the uh, difficulty of evidence gathering. As for the last bit, uh, it is to respond to the hypothetical case mentioned by Dr. Leung. And we told the DOJ, and the DOJ said that if that really arises, we'll have to enforce the law. And if we think there is sufficient evidence, if prosecution is taken out, we have to look at the individual case, jurisdiction, and also territoriality. Uh, this is what Paris 19 and 20 uh, is about, and these are worries. Thank you, Chairman. Yes, Dr. Leung. Sometimes I think the administration is mixing up issues. Um, the Where the website is, is one issue. If it is in Hong Kong, then we can govern it with our laws. But uh, the other thing is the place of uploading information. That is something else. I think these should be separated, right? When I talk about the act of distribution, I mean uploading the information. I mean the act of uploading information. I think in principle you want to govern that kind of act. Is that right? What you said just now, mixes us up uh, the location of the website and the location of the person uploading information. I think the two should be separated. I think the law should govern a person keying in information in front of a keyboard. I think you want to govern the location of that person. It's a matter of principle. If he is in Hong Kong and he uploads information, uh, then no matter where the information will go in the end, he breaks the law. Evidence gathering is something else. You say it is difficult if it involves the Internet, but maybe not. Some people may illegally download infringing material, and they can still be caught. But we are talking about a matter of principle. I was not disputing the location of the website, but the location of the uploading app. I think the law should govern that, right? Dr. Leung's question is, if he uploads information to international websites, he should still be breaking the law. But if a Hong Kong person flies to the US or Thailand and he uploads the information, then you cannot catch him. Well, that person has left Hong Kong. If a Hong Kong person goes to somewhere else, and he uh, uses marijuana. You know, um, some in some places that act is an illegal act. But then, uh, then he comes back to Hong Kong. Morally, he may be uh, problematic. But you can't say you have consumed marijuana, so I can still catch you. 
So is that possible? Can you include this in the law? In other words, if someone uploads HRT advertisements or something that purports to be an advertisement onto the internet, then he can be convicted. Is it uh, possible? That may also take care of the point raised by the legal advisor, uh, but the DOJ cannot answer that question. And that is how an internet provider in the U.S. can be caught for conviction. Uh, now it seems impossible. Chairman, actually, causing publication or distribution, well, that would already include uploading done in Hong Kong. The thing is, you should cover the uploading done in overseas countries. I think you should expand it to uploading acts done throughout the world. I was saying, if your intention only wants to govern what happens in Hong Kong, why don't you just say so? You should entrench that principle in the law, and uh, finding the evidence is something else. Uh, Chairman, you understand me, right? Legal advisor, you understand me? Well, yes, everybody understands. It's just that the administration will not budge. We say uh, what they are trying to do does not work, and if the provisions are written in such a way that they are unenforceable, then we are not going to support them. Now, I don't know how we can convince them. Mr. Chung, can you consider this part further? 15.3a is important. You should consider whether you like to propose a CSA. I don't think this argument should go on because I can't see a way out. Can I say something? Yes, Ms. Ao. Dr. Leung, you said you would like to regulate the person publishing the information. Like if, um, he, if he does not publish the advertisement in Hong Kong, then we should make it clear in the law that we should only seek to govern uploading acts done in Hong Kong. Well, we have thought about this, but we are worried that this will create a loophole. If you say as long as the uploading act is not done in Hong Kong, then there is no contravention. Well, then that would be very easy because the company can get an agent in Macau or on the mainland and the advertisement can be uploaded. But those advertisements uh, can be easily seen by people in Hong Kong. Then we will not be able to prevent the publication. Well, yes, indeed, indeed, that is the case. But Ms. Ao, let me ask you this question. The uploading is done on the mainland. And just now, Mr. Chung or Mr. Luke said, we have territoriality in our laws. So this is just outside our jurisdiction. You know you can't control that kind of acts, and you still want to say you can. Now, how can you do it? Tell me how you can do it. Chairman, we said before that even if the uploading is done overseas, that can still amount to publication in Hong Kong or distribution in Hong Kong. Well, we have no problem with distribution in Hong Kong, uh, whether it is uploading, taking our advertisements, um, distribution. We we agree with all those, but the provisions are not clear. And as a matter of fact, the X must be done in Hong Kong, and you must be able to catch him before he breaks the law. But as the legal advisor and Dr. Leung have said, you just cannot govern uploading acts and distribution acts done overseas. Can you not write this clearly into the law? Mr. Chung, number one. We can discuss this again with the DOJ because one of the considerations is how the law should be drafted. I'm not an expert in law drafting. And if you ask me, um, I, I, I think I should give you a written reply because if we want to add uh, Hong Kong into it, 
I really want to exhaust the scenarios first. I'm afraid there may be a big loophole created. In Paris 19 and 20, when we were writing this reply, we already thought whether we should narrow it or further interpret it, and whether the result would be the creation of a loophole which we would not want to create. Let, please give us some time and we can give you a written reply, please. Okay, fine. I think uh, there is not a big controversy, Diaz. Together with the legal advisor, we just want the bill to be written in a more comprehensive manner. You can see that members we just want the bill to be enforceable. We don't want you to write unreasonable or unenforceable clauses into the bill. You can cast a wide net. I understand your intention. You want to catch the entire world, but you cannot enforce it. You want to do it, but you have also said that this cannot be done. And what you are proposing to do doesn't work. As Mr. Luke already said, uh, this cannot amount to prosecution. We'll give you some time. And here, legal advisor, have you identified any other controversies under 3A and 3B so the administration can go back and think about those at one go? Legal advisor. Thank you, Chairman. There is another worrying point, and that is the word purports. I think it's fake. In English, it's purporting to, and uh, in Chinese, if you use the term hon loi si le, it usually points to say that if a document is signed by a director of a department, then uh, he or she does not have to appear in court. But in other cases, if purporting to is applied to advertisement, in Chinese uh, it is rendered as bun yi si, chok siu. So members, uh, please consider the Chinese term for purporting to and uh, whether hon loi si is too wide because uh, you seem to say uh, if it appears to be something, then it should be regarded as something even if in substance it is not that thing. And also, you may be targeting the publishers. If you say, uh, in your view, uh, it purports to, but not in the eyes of the publishers, then what will happen? Mr. Luke, with regard to the Chinese term used for purporting to, there was also um, a long discussion, and our answer is very clear. In this context, that Chinese term is useful. It is there to include uh, advertisements because sex selection may involve very complicated procedures. Some people may say, well, I'm exaggerating the effects, and indeed, uh, that advertisement will not really allow you to do sex selection. Now you can imagine couples may be anxious and they may be influenced by the advertisements and they may see advertisements purporting to offer sex selection services and so by Putting in the words purporting to, we can take care of these situations. And as I said, there is an objective criterion to decide or judge whether an advertisement is promoting sex selection. Therefore, we still think that uh, the Chinese term chosen is appropriate. Mr. Leung? Well, I thought you had dealt with this issue already. Well, um, on the linguistics front, purporting means that uh, 
It seems that way, but in in reality, it's the other way. So it's about um, but whether something is this or that should be left to the judgment of the court. If you think it purports to be, then you can whether it is really, really what it said it is, then you can leave it to the court to decide. But the way it's written now it's a, gives a very broad meaning. You know, um, the court the court found it difficult. I mean, he would find it too broad. A definition here as well. Should we narrow the scope? You can enforce the law um, with the content of purporting to, but the court will have to decide whether um, there is any illegal act. We did debate a lot on this wording. I know many members have four meetings today, so many other members cannot make it today. But in the past, D of J gave us examples of other um, you know, statistics related to uh, purporting to. But legal advice is very clear that the use of the words purporting had never been used in relation to um, advertisements. Uh, Marjong Paulus um, was also cited, were among the examples cited. So I agree with Mr. Lang here. That member Lang, that you need to understand that it will be difficult to convince the public that uh, you know an advertisement purporting to do this and that, and in fact it's not um, an advertisement or what. So I'm, I'm just I'm just worried that this could create a legal loophole. That in the future all legal professions uh, would use purporting to and constitute a ground for prosecuting. With rather than um, making a decision based on facts, so if it's illegal, it is illegal. If it's an advertisement, it is an advertisement. So the DFJ can collect evidence. The Department of Health can collect evidence to prove that is a crime. So there's no need for such wordings. By what well, the administration would you like to respond, Mr. Look? Yeah, as I said earlier. The purpose of using purporting to hear. Well, let me make it clear again. If we don't use purporting to hear, then there will be a need for proof that the advertisement um, has the effect of sex selection, that the advertisement can result in sex selection. Well, if someone were to be um, sued under this provision, that, that then that person might claim that he's just bluffing, trying to um, trick easily deceived couples. So, do we need to show or use technical evidence to 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 show otherwise? So. If we don't use proponent to, then you know that sort of difficulty could arise. We've used several examples before as well. I think um, we said earlier, and as the chairman briefly mentioned, um, you know, um, some like in the case of uh, tickets, resold tickets. If if the tickets are used to uh, purport to that someone enter a place, then you know the function of purporting to is very clear in that case. I don't need to find out. We don't need to find out whether the tickets involved could get one in to a place or not. If someone is selling tickets illegally and if that tickets give you the impression that they can get in get to a show or get into a place, then that would be enough evidence. So that's the purpose of using purporting to we don't need to um, dig deeper into whether the tickets did um, manage to get someone into a, a place. I was just thinking as you were explaining that you know, whether your analogy 
uh, your analogy is red velvet, but in the case of tickets, illegal tickets, the tickets themselves concerned may be fake. Selling a fake ticket. Actually, uh, commits another offense. Selling, you know, um, fake tickets is one offense, and selling tickets illegally is another offense. So, I'm just thinking whether your analogy is appropriate. I was saying that. Let me. Uh, can you answer me a simple question first? Say if uh, you, if you sue someone on the basis of this uh, provision with the words "purporting to," and the court says that well. He doesn't think that the advertisement purports to promote sex selection, but the proof. Well, he says maybe the court rules that the advertisement does not really promote, but it purport to promote. So, the is is it is it your intent to um, get these people? Um, held legally responsible, even if the court thinks that the um, advertisement does not really promote that selection. So you just want people to be held liable, even if the advertisement does not promote really promote set selection. Yeah, that's what I'm worried because we don't want it to set a precedent that for advertisement or acts that do not constitute a criminal offense um, become. Um, convicted, you know, just because of subjective perceptions. So if there's a flaw in the provision, we can't accept it. We need to be very careful with this. Even if the administration pushes through with its provisions, I'm sure that you know members might propose uh, their own amendments. We may have to um, have CSAs. So I do hope the administration can think about it again. Can anyone respond? Is the administration clearly prepared to just be stricter here? So any, even if it's a scientific literature, you want to make even objective scientific literature liable with this broad definition, Mr. Chong. Well, definitely, we don't mean to um, be very stringent here. Or excessively stringent. What Mr. Look was trying to say was that advertise advertisements sometimes, you know, depending on the content, may, you know, um, spell exactly the kinds of services to be provided. Sometimes they may use uh, vague words instead. So if we use purporting to, this could, you know, uh, actually put under the um, the facts of the law, even those advertisements with vague promises. I think that's the um, that's what Mr. Lok was trying to explain. Be because sometimes the advertisements, you know, may not a hundred percent give you the actual um, or tell you about the actual services involved. So my understanding is that I know um, what you're concerned with. So, Chairman, can I ask the legal advisor? Just then, you said, "Is said the legal advisor, Miss Jo?" Are you suggesting that the Chinese version should not use Hanoi C, but um, use the other phrase? Yes. Chairman, I think I can provide you uh, members with some reference materials. In similar provisions, uh, the words used there. In another provision, if the English is purporting to, in relation to advertisements, the Chinese interpretation is bonisi. In other legislations, with the words purporting to, they are not related to advertisements. Sometimes, the Chinese translation is keyongisi. So maybe the administration can make reference to that. Thank you. Bonisi in Chinese or yongisi. 
In English, the, the original intention very clear. That's it. It does have the original intention. So even though in purporting to in English means the same thing, but in Chinese, I think there are differences among the various races. Uh, Mr. Chong, uh, Mr. Luke. You know, you have to beware that you know it's up to the court to to make a judgment. But if the provision is written in such a um, casual way, then I don't think it is a good thing. Not is a good thing to Lachko. Mr. Chung just said that it didn't mean to make the provision excessively stringent. If we use Hon I see in Chinese, then this could easily uh, put people under trap because it would uh, do away with any objective judgments and it will violate the, our intention as well in that code. Mr. Chung, I need to discuss with D of J and, and look into it further. I understand your concerns. Yes, uh, two other members have just arrived. Um, now we are at the clause by clause scrutiny stage. Um, among the provisions, the two controversies are the point made by D of J and members that 3A and um, in the part relating to advertisements, it's obvious that the administration and D of J. In response, say that if the advertisements, advertisements are not distributed or posted on the internet or websites locally, then the no for law enforcement can be taken if they're not posted or distributed in Hong Kong. So we are suggested to the uh, legal advice and us also, and Leon Carlo suggested that the three A should be rephrased to say that the advertisements. Concern should be um, uploaded and distributed in Hong Kong, because only this can allow for law enforcement here. Even if you write that you know it covers advertisements that post anywhere, I mean, no enforcement can be taken anyway if it's outside of Hong Kong. And secondly, we're concerned with the use of the word "purporting to," the Chinese versions of the words "purporting, purporting to." We don't have any dispute over the English version, but the Chinese version could be written as Bu Ni Si, Yong Ni Si, Ke Yong Ni Si, as opposed to what is written now, um, to mean the original intention of the drafter. And we think that the other Chinese translations can better reflect the intention of the bill. Just then the administration said that they had no intention of Actually, um, trying to um, be very stringent and, and enforce the law in an unreasonable manner. Okay, another one. Of course, we are worried about the limits to law enforcement. If you can't take any action legally, then there's no point putting down any unnecessary details. You have to write it in such a way that people know it's targets at local acts. But my question is. You know, we're concerned most about the internet, the internet world. If an advertisement can is accessed or is uploaded overseas or on Facebook, if I like such an advertisement, then it would appear on my Facebook page. Then would that Cost you to publishing or distributing the advertisement consent? Yeah, they answered before uh, last time. So, Mr. Lok and Mr. Chung, could you answer this again? Chairman, I think this is a new offense needs to, um, you know, actually involves the intention to distribute or, distribute or publish. I don't know whether it's this intent or not, because people just, you know, maybe. Um, Slipping and then uh, resting on the bus and then just like it on Facebook page. Oh, uh -huh. Do you call it an intent? 
Dr. Wong's argument is about intention. Let me say once more, we can only convict people under Hong Kong laws only when there is no or when there is beyond reasonable doubt that the proof must be without reasonable doubt that there is a mens rea for the offense. As Dr. Wong was saying, if you just like something on Facebook, uh, you mean it's all right? Well, when we submit evidence, it may not be done uh, beyond reasonable doubt. The DOJ may say, I have photographed your Facebook page. And on the 1st of July, you liked uh, sex selection advertisement. And how can you say there is mens rea or not? Because the actus reus is there. What happens? Would people have broken the law then? Dr. Wong, um, they have written to us a few times saying that on social media and surf search engines, if something is done, they won't regard it as such. But they did not go to into details about liking things on Facebook. Maybe the legal advisor can clarify. If you don't regard the social media, I think you should write it in because many forms of publication take place in the world of the Internet. It may be an email and people may say um, their friends might like it and they might do it for fun or they want to send the information to everybody in your address book. Would that amount to an offense? The legal advisor, uh, what is your viewpoint? Thank you, Chairman. I think uh, I shared your worry, and that is why in one letter I propose to the administration one defense, and that is to exempt uh, private and non-commercial communication on social media. But the administration did not budge. Why? Mr. Chung, the DOJ told us that in uh, law enforcement there are two aspects, one actus reus and the other one mens rea. And the law enforcement agent has to establish mens rea. If it is just the pressing of a button, as Mr. Luke said, that should not be caught. As for private communication, we gave consideration to it. It is a very important consideration vis-a-vis -vis mens rea um, if the law is to be enforced. But uh, we have similar worries because we can think of a situation where a person can dismiss something as private email. But in fact, the email can be sent to hundreds of people. And our concern is if this is added in, then we may be creating loopholes for people to circumvent the proposed offense. Prosecution-wise, the major principle is that we have to establish both mens rea and actus reas, and they must happen at the same time. Uh, thank you. Uh, Mr. Raymond Chan, sorry, uh, we have uh, the security panel meeting next door. But I'd like to say that the administration has dismissed all our proposals as loopholes. We are afraid that the law may be too wide and innocent people may be caught. But let me concentrate on distribution. I'm talking about um, superlinks on the Internet. And next door, we also have a copyright ordinance meeting um, sharing hyperlinks will not become an offense even if the hyperlink will lead you to 
law-breaking websites because we cannot have control over material carried in the hyperlinks. Last time, the uh, administration also said when you share hyperlinks, you might write a line to introduce it, and if the line itself is an advertisement, then I can understand if you introduce this hyperlink and you describe it, then you will be caught. And now I can give you an example to ask this question. Will you have a different approach or are you even more strict than the copyright ordinance? Because copyright owners are forcing the administration to do something, say uh, they ask people to click into a link and people can watch an entire drama episode and they ask why still this is exempted. I like to say whether you are more ambitious, in other words, you are stricter than the copyright ordinance. And also, you say if uh, there is an advertisement and you describe it, you promote the hyperlink, then uh, that's different. But if I don't write anything, I just share a hyperlink about a sex selection advertisement from overseas, then uh, this will not be established under the copyright ordinance. But if I don't describe it in any way, I just share the hyperlink, which is an advertisement. Now, from your understanding, will I be caught under this bill? We have looked at overseas case law about the sharing of hyperlink. We have this case law about Amazon.com. And it is said that the Google's hyperlink is not um, an offense because the images will not automatically appear on the computers of users. It will only uh, give a browser as a link so that images will eventually appear on the user's computers. So uh, the U.S. court rules that uh, hyperlink is not uh, sharing, is not an offense. Sometimes you don't even have to click into it, you can see the entire clip on your Facebook page. But according to the U.S. court, this would not amount to tort. I'd like to ask you about this HRT and uh, when you ban sex selection advertisements, what about the sharing of hyperlinks without any description? Will I be caught? Who can take the question, Mr. Chong or Mr. Luke? Mr. Luke. As we said, we have found a Canadian case of reference value. If you only share a hyperlink, it will not it will not amount to distribution of the contents of the hyperlink. If the content of the hyperlink is the advertisement, and if I cannot control the content of the hyperlink, then it cannot be said that I am publishing or distributing that clip. So he is saying you will not be caught, but this is not in the bill. As long as I share a hyperlink of a YouTube clip, of uh, an overseas advertisement on sex selection, then I won't break the law. But then that is very far away from your legislative intent. Uh, you have not been happy to examine many things, but what about this one, sharing of hyperlink? Just like the uh, copyright ordinance. Mr. Chung, again, we cannot be exhaustive in tackling different scenarios because the Internet is a different form of communication. And as Mr. Luke said, at this stage we have some case law, but uh, they uh, cannot form any binding guidelines. Our worry is still that, again, if we provide the exemption, then it will create a loophole for people to circumvent the offense we are trying to create. We would like also to have certain binding effect on advertisements. We understand the Internet is new and not easy to cope. Different bureaus and different bills may
face、um, ever-changing situations on the internet. But for the time being, we will not support、um, any private sharing. No, it's not private or otherwise. I'm talking about sharing of hyperlinks.、I、understand the difficulties, but now when we are already doing clause by clause examination, I don't think we can carry on the discussion in this bill's committee. The copyright bill、um, is challenged by the copyright owners, but if、uh, that is the case, I'm sure netizens would again cry foul. And what will you do? You say you don't want to write in the exemption. I don't care whether the Canadian case is binding on you, but you have to let us know exactly what is on your mind. In terms of the legislative intent,、um, do you think,、uh, as law drafters, that this can be done or not? Well, can I add one more point, Mr. Chung? Your bill does not identify the internet as one channel for distributing advertisements, but as Mr. Chen said, you must face the internet. Is it possible? To make reference to the copyright ordinance and how it tackles hyperlinks、uh, or sharing of communication,、uh, so as to allay our worries about the spill. Mr. Chung, I am not familiar with the other laws mentioned by. Mr. Chan, I think I can only talk to the DOJ again. Okay, you go back and talk to your、uh, the DOJ colleagues responsible for copyright ordinance.、Uh, Chairman, I think we should rethink the legal advisor's proposal. The sharing of a link may be appalling. If on Facebook I share an image, is it that I am caught as well? Because basically, many people. Like and share information on the internet. If that amounts to the breaking of the law, then too bad. Many people will be breaking the law unless you don't enforce the law. If that's the case, why don't why what would you like to propose this bill? Now, if you want to have three capital A, you might want to narrow it to say only pecuniary interest、uh, and advertisements involving monetary interest. Will be caught if people share or like pages on Facebook, which does not have a monetary interest. Then、uh, they should not be caught. However, if on Facebook you、um, make a page and advertise on it, well, that you know costs money and it will be regarded as a commercial advertisement. But if you like something or share something on your own Facebook and you don't have to pay a fee to do it, then you should not seek to control those. You should actually say that、um, only commercial advertisements are controlled. Then we don't need to argue and with you that、uh, you might infringe upon the freedom of expression. Can you just concentrate on commercial advertisements? Can someone answer the question? If you don't do this, we might move CSAs. Well, I'm sure we need to. It seems we are repeating our viewpoints every time, Mr. Chung. About commercial interest, I may need to repeat myself. The question was raised last time, and we also talked to the DOJ. We have written to say that it may be difficult to enforce the law because the payment for advertisements. Might be deferred to a much later point in time, and also there may be many business dealings between two parties, meaning they have other dealings other than the advertisement. It would be extremely difficult to identify the specific transitions. Uh, transactions from the accounts as proof of the financial gain for placing advertisements. 
and uh, we can expect a lot of difficulty in gathering evidence. So we have already commented on this, and we would not want to require the proof of financial gain. As for Facebook advertisements, I think we'll um, discuss it with you of Jay first. Yeah, I also like the legal advisor to give us some information here on the the need to prove um, financial gain under existing legislations. Any references we can um, draw from? Well, obviously, I think today there are a few key points that um, we have yet to achieve a consensus today. We can see that. If the administration insists on pushing through this um, bill, I suppose there will be definitely some CSAs. Well, if that's the case, then would the administration want to think about including narrowing the scope? You said that there are areas that you cannot um, apply the law anyway. And the legal advisor also gave us some um, phrases with reference value, as we said, purporting to the Chinese translations of it. I believe I think many members are worried that you are using a too broad a definition that could actually include even non advertisements. That's unrelated to this bill itself. In um honestly, having heard so long from members, no one none of us are against the bill to um stop Human reproductive technology services, but we just worry about the wordings. So please consider that. I have no other views to add. Uh, well, I think let's set a time for the next meeting and to give the administration time to consider the th three key points or concerns that we have kept repeating again and again. Well, the administration is not prepared to uh, provide you know, clauses of exemptions, so I think there's no point carrying on. There are three areas that we need to dis uh, consider further. The areas where the um, advertisements are uploaded. And second concern is about the wordings, Chinese translations of purporting and financial gain. And then the one just then made it very clear. Our concern about financial gain. Otherwise, you cannot you know, uh, for everyone who uses social media, you know, be, um, you know, feeling at ease. You know, people, lifestyles now revolve, revolve around social media. You know, if you don't make any changes, then groups active on those uh, platforms would have uh, much arguments with you, and we can't stop that. So we'll give you adequate time for that. Let's set a date. Secretary, it's June now. Uh, our schedules are quite packed. So early July, okay, before the end of the term, early July. Administration, any particular directives? I know that for this logical term, we may not be able to um, pros, uh, pass this because it, I don't think there's time for the full sitting to um, pass this bill. Anyway, so we just give it more time. Shall we meet in July? Okay. If there's no other business, then this meeting is adjourned. Thank you.